Live from San Jose, it's theCUBE. Presenting Big Data Silicon Valley. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin with George Gilbert. We are live at our event, Big Data SV in downtown San Jose, down the street from the Strata Data Conference. We're joined by a new guest to theCUBE, Sastri Malati, the CTO of Foghorn. Sastri, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Appreciate so Foghorn, it. cool name. What do you guys do? Who are you? Tell us all that good stuff. Sure, we are a, a startup based in Silicon Valley right here in uh, Mountain View. We started about three years ago, three plus years ago. We provide Edge computing, intelligent software for edge computing or fog computing. That's how our company name got started, is Foghorn. For, particularly for IoT industrial sector. Um, all of the industrial guys, whether it's transportation, manufacturing, oil and gas, smart cities, smart buildings, any of those different sectors, they use our software to predict failure conditions in real time, or do condition monitoring, or predictive maintenance, any of those use cases, and successfully save uh, a lot of money. Obviously, in, in the process, you know, we get paid for, for what we do. Yeah. So, um, Sastri, you know, GE popularized this concept of IIoT and the analytics and the high, sort of the new business outcomes you could build on it, like power by the hour instead of selling a jet engine. That's right. Um, but there's, um, and, and actually Wikibon and David Flurit did some pioneering research on, you know, how we're going to have to do a lot of the analytics on the edge for latency and bandwidth. Right. Um, what's the Foghorn secret sauce that others you know, would have difficulty with on, on the edge analytics? Okay, that's a great question. Before I answer, directly answer the question, if you don't mind, I'll actually even um, describe why that's even important to do that. Right? Okay. So a lot of these industrial customers, um, if you look at it, because we work with a lot of them, the amount of data that's produced from all of these different machines is terabytes to petabytes of data. It's real. And it's not just the traditional digital sensors, but there are video, audio, acoustic sensors out there. The amount of data is humongous, right? It's not even practical to send all of that to a cloud environment and do data processing for many reasons. One is obviously the connectivity, bandwidth issues, and all of that. But the two most important things are cybersecurity. None of these customers actually want to connect these highly expensive machines to the internet. That's one. The second is the lack of real-time decision making. What they want to know when there is a problem, they want to know before it's too late. Uh, we want to notify them here is a problem that's occurring so they have a chance to go fix it and optimize their asset uh, that, uh, that is in question. Now, existing solutions do not work in this constrained environment. That's why Foghorn had to uh, invent that solution. And tell us actually, just to be specific, how constrained an environment you can operate in. We could run in about uh, less than 100 to 150 megabytes of memory, single core to dual core of CPU, whether it's an ARM processor, an x86 Intel-based processor, almost literally no storage, because we're a real-time processing engine. Yeah. Optionally, you could have some storage if you wanted to, store some of the results locally there, but that's the kind of environment we were talking about. Now, when I say 100 megabytes of memory, 100 figure, you know, it's like a quarter of a Raspberry Pi, right? And uh, even in that environment, we have customers that run a dozens of machine learning models, right? If we're not talking like a, about an ensemble, like a, an uh, like an anomaly detection or a regression or a random forest or a clustering or a k-means, some of those. Now, if you get into more deep learning models like image processing and neural nets and all of that, obviously need a little bit more memory. But what we have shown. We could still run one of our largest uh, 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 smart city buildings customer, elevator company, runs in a Raspberry Pi on millions of elevators, right? And dozens of machine learning algorithms on top of that, right? So that's the kind of size we're talking about. Okay. Oh, let me just follow up with one question on the, the other thing you said. Besides that we have to do the low latency you know, locally, you said a lot of um, uh, customers don't want to connect these uh, brownfield, I guess, operations technology machines to the internet and, and physically, I mean, there was physical separation for security. That's right. So it's like security, Bill Joy used to say security by obscurity Absol here. It's, absolutely. it's, it's security yes. by like. Physical not, separation. Yeah, absolutely. physical separation. Tell me about, I was actually coming from, if you don't mind saying, last week I was in Saudi Arabia, one of the oil and gas plants where we deployed our software. You have to go to five levels of security even to get to that. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, plant and refining the gas and all of that. Completely 
offline, no connectivity to the internet. No. And we install in their existing small box, our software, connected to their live video cameras that are actually measuring the stuff, doing the processing and detecting the specific condition they were looking for. That's my question, which was, if they want to be monitoring, so there's like one low level, really low hardware low level is the sensor feeds. Right. But you could actually have a richer feed, which is video and, and, and audio. That's right. But is how much of that then are you um, doing the sort of inferencing locally or even retraining? And I assume that since it's not the OT device and it's something that's looking at it, right. you might be more able to send it back up the cloud if you needed to do retraining? That, that's exactly right. So the way the model works is particularly for image processing because you need, um, it's a more complex process to train and create a model. Yeah. You could create a model offline like in a GPU box, an FPGA box, and whatnot, import and bring the model back into this small little device that's running in the plant, and now the live video data is coming in, the model is inferencing the specific thing. Now there are two ways to uh, update and revise the model. Incremental revision of the model, if you could do that if you want, or if you can send the results to a central location, not internet, they do have a local, in this example, for example, a PyDB, an OSS of PyDB or some other local service out there, where you have an op opportunity to gather the results from each of these different locations and then consolidate and retrain the model, pull the model back again. Okay, the, the one part that I didn't follow completely is, yeah. um, if, you, if the, the model is running ultimately on the device, That's like and, it, and perhaps not even on a CPU, but a, a programmable logic controller, it could, even a, a programmable controller also typically have some notion of a CPU there okay, as well. Okay. Uh, these days, most of the PLCs, programmable controllers, have either an ARM-based processor or an x86-based processor. Okay. We can run on either one of those two. So, okay, assume you've got the you've got the model deployed down there for the, you know, local inferencing. Right. Now, some retraining is going to go on in the cloud where you have you're pulling in a richer perspective from many different devices. That's correct. How does that model get back out to the device if it doesn't have the um, connectivity between the device and the cloud? Right, so if there is strictly no connectivity, so what happens is once the model is regenerated or retrained, they put a model on a USB stick, the low tech, right, USB stick, bring it to the PLC device and upload the model. Oh, so this is sort of how we destroyed the Iranian <laughs> centrifuges. <laughs> That's exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. Okay. But, you know, some other uh, environments, even though it's not connectivity to to the cloud environment per se, but the devices have the ability to connect to the cloud yeah, optionally to say, look, I'm the device that's coming up, do you have an updated model for me? Then it can pull the model. Okay. So in some other environment, it's super strict where there's absolutely no way to connect this device. You put it in a USB stick and bring the model back here. Other environments, device can query the cloud, but not cloud cannot connect to the device. This is a very popular model these days because, in other words, imagine this, an elevator sitting in a building Somebody from the cloud cannot reach the elevator, but an elevator can reach the cloud when it wants to. So sort of like a jet engine. You don't want the cloud to reach the jet exactly engine. That's exactly right. Jet engine can reach the cloud if it wants to, when it wants to, but a cloud cannot reach the jet engine. That's how we can pull the model. Okay. Yeah. So Sastra, as a CTO, you meet with customers often. You mentioned you were in Saudi Arabia last week. I'd love to understand how you're leveraging, engaging with customers to really help drive the development of Foghorn in terms of being differentiated in the market. What are those kind of bi-directional, symbiotic customer relationships like and how are they helping Foghorn? Right, that's actually a great question. We learn a lot from customers because we started a long time ago. We did an initial version of the product. As we begin to talk to the customers, particularly that's part of my job, where I go talk to many of these customers, they give us feedback. Well, my problem is really that I can't even do, I can't even give you uh, connectivity to the cloud to update the model. I can't even give you sample data. How do you do that modeling, right? And sometimes they say, you know what? We are not technical people. Help us express the problem, the outcome, how, give me tools that, that help me express that outcome. So we created a bunch of what we call OT tools, operational technology tools. How we distinguish ourselves in this process from the traditional cloud-based vendors or traditional data science and data analytics companies is that they think in terms of computer scientists, computer programmers, and expressions. We think in terms of industrial operators. What, what can they express? What do they know? They don't really necessarily care about when you tell them, I've got a, 
uh, an anomaly detection data science machine learning algorithm, they're going to look at you like, that, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about, right? You need to tell them, look, this machine is failing. What are the conditions in which the machine is failing? How do you express that? And then we translate that requirement or, or that into the underlying models, underlying well expressions, values, or uh, CEP expression language. So we, we learned a ton from user interface, capabilities, latency issues, connectivity issues, different protocols, a number of things that we learned from the customers. So um, I'm curious with like um, some, more of the big data vendors are, are recognizing you know, data in motion and data coming from devices. That's right. So, and some like um, the Hortonworks Dataflow NiFi has a Minify component written in C++, really yes. low uh, resource footprint. But I'm a, I assume that that's really just a transport. It's almost like a collector, and that they don't. It doesn't have the analytics built in. Am I? That's exactly right. Nifi has the transport. It has the real-time transport capability for sure. What it does not have is this notion of um, the CEP concept. How do you combine all of the streams of everything? Is a time series data for us, right? From the devices, whether it's coming from a device or whether it's coming from another static source out there. How do you express a pattern? Uh, recognition pattern definition across these streams. That's where our CEP comes in a picture. A lot of these seemingly similar uh, software capabilities that people talk about don't quite exactly have either the streaming capability or the CEP capability or the real time or the low footprint. What we have is a combination of all of that. And um, you talk about everything's time series to you. Right. Um, is there a need to have uh, sort of a, an equivalent time series database up? in some central location, so that when you subset, when you determine what relevant subset of data to move up to the cloud or you know, on-prem central location, does it need to be the same database? No, it doesn't need to be the same database, it's optional. In fact, we do ship a local time series database at the edge itself. Yeah. If you have a little bit of a local storage, you can uh, downsample, take the results, and store it locally, and many customers actually do that. Yeah. Some others, because they have their existing environment, they have some cloud storage, whether it's you know, AWS, Microsoft, PyDB, it doesn't matter what they use, we have connectors from our software to send these results into their existing environments. So you had also said something interesting about your, your sort of tool set as being optimized for operations technology. That's right. So this is really important because Back when we had the net heads and the bell heads, right. you know, it was a cultural clash mm -hmm. and they had different technologies. They sure did, um, yeah. Tell us more about the, how, how selling to operations, to, not just selling, but supporting operations technology is different from IT sort of technology and, and where does that boundary sort of live? Right, so typical IT environment, right? You start with the boss who is the decision maker Right, you work with them and then they approve the project and you go and execute that. In an industrial, in an OT environment, it doesn't quite work like that. Even if the boss says that, well, go ahead and go do this project, if the operator on the floor doesn't understand what you're talking about, because that person is in charge of that operating that machine, it doesn't quite work like that. So you need to work bottom up as well to convincing them that you are indeed actually solving their pain point. So the way we start with, rather than trying to tell them what capabilities we have as a product or what we're trying to do, the first thing we ask is, what is their pain point? What's your problem? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Some customers say, well, I've got yield, uh, a lot of uh, you know, scrap. Help me reduce my scrap. Help me you know, operate my equipment better. Help me predict these failure conditions before it's too late. That's how the problem starts. Then we start inquiring them, okay, what, what kind of data do you have? What, do we, what kind of sensors do you have? Typically, do you have information about under what circumstances you have seen failures versus not seen failures out there. So in the process of interrogation, we begin to understand you know, how they might actually use our software. And then we tell them, well, here is use your software, our software to predict that. And sorry, 130 more seconds yeah. on that. So the other thing is that typically in an IT environment, because I came from that to have been in this business for 30 plus years, IT, OT, and all of that, where we don't right away talk about CEP or expressions or analytics or machine learning, we don't talk about it that. We talk about, look, you have these bunch of sensors, we have OT tools here, drag and drop your sensors, express the outcome that you're trying to look for, what is the outcome you're trying to look for, um, and then, then we drive behind the scenes what it means. Is it analytics, is it machine learning, is it something else, and what is it? So that's kind of how we approach the problem. Of course, if the, sometimes you do 
uh, surprisingly occasionally run into very technical people. For those people, we can right away talk about, hey, here is analytics, here is machine learning, here is an expression, all of that. That's kind of how we operate. Um, one thing you know, that, that's becoming clearer is, I think there's widespread recognition that there's data intensive and low latency work to be done near the edge. That's right. But what goes on in the cloud is actually closer to simulation and high performance compute if you want to optimize a model. It's not just train it, but to maybe have something that's prescriptive um, that says, you know, here's the actionable kind of information. Um, as more of your data is sort of video and audio, how do you turn that into something where you can sort of simulate a model that, you know, tells you sort of the optimal answer? Right, so it's actually a good question from our experience, right? There are models that require a lot of data, for example, video, audio, that. There are some other models that do not require a lot of data for training. I'll give you an example of both customer use cases that we have. There is one customer in a manufacturing domain where they've been seeing a lot of finished goods failures. There's a lot of scrap. And the problem there was, hey, you know, predict the failures, reduce my scrap, save the money, right? Because they've been seeing a lot of failures every single day, we did not need a lot of data to train and create a model to do that. So in fact, we just needed a one hour's worth of data. We, we put a, created a model, put the thing that we have reduced, completely eliminated their scrap, right? There are other kinds of models. Um, other kinds of models of the video where we can't do that at the edge. So we require, for example, some video files or simulated audio files, take it to an offline model, create the model, and see whether it's accurately predicting what the, based on the real-time video coming in or not. So it, it's a mix of really what uh, we're seeing between those two. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sastry, thank you so much for stopping by theCUBE and sharing what it is that you guys at Foghorn are doing, what you're hearing from customers, how you're working together with them to solve some of these pretty significant challenges. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Hope this was helpful and uh, yeah. Very Definitely, much. very yeah. educational. Yeah. We want to thank you for watching theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin with George Gilbert. We are live at our event, Big Data SV in downtown San Jose. Come stop by Forge or Tasting Room, hang out with us, learn as much as we are about all the layers of big data, digital transformation, and the opportunities. Stick around, we will be back after a short break.